All right, our scripture today comes from John 1, verses 1 through 5, and then 9 through 18. So you can follow along with me um, on the screen or in your Bibles. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In verse 9, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. This is God's word. Thank you, Abby. Welcome. Welcome back to, or welcome to the first time, to the Apostles' Creed series here at Sojourn. Um, I'm just going to sit this down over here. Um... This week, we move into the next phrase that we're looking at, which is pretty early on that we read a minute ago, um, maker of heaven and earth or creator of heaven and earth. Uh, Each week in this series, we're taking a look at uh, the next phrase, one phrase um, that we say together, that we believe and that we trust, that we have faith in, and try to understand a little more about um, why that matters, why it's important to confess that together. Um, I've been around church people my entire life. I'm not trying to brag, I'm just telling you the truth. And um, one, one thing that, I, that has been clear to me, it may have been clear to you too, um, is that whenever the topic of creation and God as creator comes up, the conversation typically inevitably goes a certain way. 90% of the conversations that, that, about these things turn at some point into a discussion of how God, bless you, how God made the world. Um, Yeah, how long did it take? What methods did he use to make this process happen? Was it six literal days? Was it six to 10,000 years ago? Was it uh, billions of years using adaptations and evolution? Um, Or was it some nuanced middle understanding that, you know, is a combination? not all of these conversations are necessarily contentious or, or heated debates, but, but I have found them to be very consuming uh, when we discuss the reality of God as creator of heaven and earth, and therefore potentially distracting from maybe more important issues. Um, here's the thing. I think it's important. I think it's very important. But I, I also think um, that our relationship with God will not be greatly hindered or helped by where we land on that issue. It's my own opinions, getting them out of the way up front. Um, I think a young earth creationist and an old earth creationist are both going to be able to worship the God of the Bible deeply in spirit and truth because they both believe that God created the heavens and the earth. Um, What I'm just trying to say is that the Bible doesn't exactly tell me whether or not for certain there have been ages and ages through which God has created or, or not. It doesn't tell me. It doesn't give me a clear, uh, extremely literal depiction of God's process. There's some interesting science on both sides, and I'd be happy to discuss more of that with you. I have my opinions like everybody else. But what the Bible is seemingly concerned about, deeply concerned about, 
is the, the, the biblical teaching about creation is, is, is not so much about how God created, but why God created. What, what, not so much about the methods he used, but about the meaning of it all. What's God's intentions behind this? And how are we supposed to relate to this physical world around us and relate to nature and, and therefore relate to God as the creator and, and, and know him as creator, um, the creator behind everything? Um, and it, honestly, this, this understanding of the, the intentions of creation is what really sets Christianity apart from all the other religions and philosophies uh, in a very unique way. But the, the point is, is that the biblical doctrine of creation is not so much about how as much as it is about why. And I have found that the philosophy or the view that we have about the created world and why God made it, that sort of thing that we believe about this, that we hold underneath the belief that he made it, has a much greater impact on our relationship and our ability to trust and believe in God. Uh, and I would even argue that you could say it in reverse. Uh, uh, our relationship with God can greatly impact what we believe uh, about creation and how we understand its purposes. So hopefully we can see both sides of that this morning. Um, have we adopted the perceptions and perspectives of the world even partially, and how, has that, how is that connected to our experience of believing into the creator of heaven and earth? Let's, let's break this down under three headings. First, we're going to look at competing paradigms. Second, we're going to look at the nature of nature. And third, the recreator. Uh, there's a lot to cover this morning, so let's, let's walk through this together. First, competing paradigms. Let's reread John 1, 1 through 5, and then we'll stop there and discuss some more things. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not, has not overcome it. Throughout history, I mean, I mean, the entire history of Christianity, Christians have always had to try to unpack uh, what the Bible is saying about creation uh, versus what their old religions and cultures said about the created world. And usually people are dealing with one kind of paradigm at a time. Uh, as Christianity expanded east and as it expanded west, uh, 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 they needed to reckon with how God describes uh, uh, his intentions for creation versus their culture's previous understanding. It makes sense. Um, but for better or worse, the melting pot of America and the glory of the internet means that we're now exposed to nearly all of these paradigms at the same time. And, and we have to sort of recognize that they're all competing for our understanding of the world around us. So let's look at four things that this passage tells us and then look at sort of break down the four may, maybe, maybe most popular uh, cultural uh, views that distract us from those truths. Um, because the Bible says that God created the world, our bodies, our, our pets, our, the dirt, the trees, the stars, everything we see and can't see, God did that. That's verse 3. We just read that. But the Bible also teaches us, and this may not, just saying these things may not sound that controversial, but, but, but we've, we've got to dive into them a little bit because it's pretty nuanced. Creation is real. <laughs> Creation is real. It's physical. It exists apart from God. It is its own thing. God made something other than himself. Verse 14, the word became flesh. Flesh was not already a part of God in the world. It is something other than himself that he took on and moved into. It is real and it is substantive. And that the other thing is that what God created is good. Uh, there is a goodness to be seen in it. Uh, verse 3 tells us that all things are made through him, and we know him to be good. And the other thing is that God made it intentionally. It's designed. Everything is an intentional expression of God's desires. Verse 3, without him was not anything made that was made. And then finally, I think one of the, the, the final four things I want to point out is that it's also limited. It requires God's sustaining power to enliven it and hold it together. Verse 4, in him, the word, God, was life. Life, his life, is required to make this thing work. So creation is real, it is good, 
It is intentional, and it is limited. It is real and separate from God as opposed to the teachings and the paradigms of pantheism and Eastern religion. It is good and originated from the goodness and the love of, and, and loving relationship of God as opposed to the teachings of Western thought, and I would also argue modern-day Christian legalism. It is intentionally designed with a purpose as opposed to a framework taught by secularists and, and, and most academics. And it is also limited and requires life outside of itself, which will fly in the face of those who elevate creation and the physical world to expect more from it than it truly has to offer, viewing it as an unlimited resource, mirroring the pagan cultures of old. Here's the thing. Out of all the church people I've ever known, no one has ever said, you know, I kind of see myself as a pantheistic pagan. No one's ever said that. But I believe many people, and myself included, functionally believe enough of these other worldviews to distort our view of creation and therefore the intentions of the creator of heaven and earth that we say we believe in. So let's take a deeper look at these four sort of competing paradigms. The first one is that creation isn't real. This is sort of counteracted in verses 3 and 14, as we said, but let's just, let's just dive into this a little bit. Um, Eastern religions, or what could be called pantheism, have always taught that the creation you see around you is essentially an illusion. Creation just, it, 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 it doesn't exist separate from God. Rather, everything we see is just a uh, projection or a manifestation of God, and uh, we're all sort of a part of this all soul. And unless you have been influenced by a lot of Buddhist thought, uh, this may seem very foreign, but... but Essentially, it's the basis for the movie The Matrix, which may be a little bit more of a cultural common ground for us. Um, the physical reality we see is it's, it's not really substantive. It's all sort of a projection. And therefore, our goal should be to try to transcend, to rise above the physical reality. Not that we can all dodge bullets. I'm not trying to say that. But, but, but the subtle elements of this can begin to creep into our understanding of the world that we see all around us. Maybe we find it comforting to, to think of ourselves in, as some sort of uh, God-provided simulation, you know, and, and, the, and the objective here for us now today is just to rise above and just connect with God spiritually and disconnect ourselves from temporal suffering, from temporal pleasure even. And the higher call is just to connect spiritually and transcend our spiritual situation or our physical situation and transcend the physical space that we find ourselves in and all the good and bad things that have come along with that. But you see in the biblical doctrine of creation that creation is real. And in the beginning, it was just God. And at some point, there are things that are created, that are made through him, but they're not a projection of him because he became created in verse 14. So in other words, what we're saying is, we believe that God is, is the creator of heaven and earth. When we say that, we're acknowledging, we're acknowledging the reality in which we live now and that we recognize that we have to reckon with. And we can't avoid it. We can't just transcend it and try to escape. We have to submit to it as opposed to thinking somehow we don't have to be honest about this physical space that we find ourselves in, that we exist in with all of its beauty and its difficulty. The second thing Second competing paradigm is that creation is bad. This is, verses, this is counteracted in verses one through three. And in the West, in Greco-Roman philosophy, basically it is understood that, that, that the spirit is good and the body is bad. That's, that's, that's the breakdown. The body is just the prison house of the soul. And therefore, physical pleasure is always guilty until proven innocent. Self-denial is important. Uh, we must deny ourselves. And, and this view, this view has come down into the church and very easily takes root because, as you can probably hear, it sounds very similar to some things that Jesus actually said. And it can be manipulated as a way of seemingly affirming this understanding. But this is not a biblical view at all because it's essentially legalism. Denying yourself pleasure is considered virtuous, period. Many Christians buy into something that, I, that is often, I, I've, I've heard, called the negative view of God's will or the negative will of God. And the negative will of God theory is essentially this, and, and maybe you've done this, or I, I've done this. I know that. 
the, the theory goes like this. You say, okay, how can I know what God's will is for my life? There's a couple of decisions in front of me. Which one is God's will? Well, it's probably the one that hurts the most. <laughs> right? Because that's, which one makes me deny myself the most? Because that has to be what God's will is for me, right? Because that's the way it is. Hmm. But look, we're forgetting something. That thought process, that whole approach to God, as rooted in Christianity as it may seem to us, is ultimately a derivative of the Greco-Roman culture that says the physical world is bad and, is, and, and it has found a space to exist unchecked in legalistic Christianity nearly since its foundations. The Bible shows us that at the very beginning, God has his hands in the dirt making everything and it's an overflow of this loving relationship and, and repeatedly through the creation story in Genesis, it's called good over and over and over again. And the Greeks and the Romans and those people who the Christianity first came to really struggled to believe this. All of their creation myths and, and it were always either creation is just the result of some accident or it's, it's a form of, it, it's the result of some form of rebellion, some fighting and difficulty that caused this. But here, God is in a loving relationship and creating all things through that relationship. Some may say, okay, and then this is, this is the counter-argument. Well, maybe it was good before the fall, but we can't look at creation and our physical world and, and pleasure and these things and see good in them now, after the fall. We can't see good in these things. We shouldn't. But Psalm 104 speaks to not only the goodness of God in the foundations of creation, but God also providing continued goodness into and through creation by sustaining it and holding it together. And as Paul says in 1 Timothy 4, that everything God created is good. Not that it used to be good, but isn't anymore. But there is still a goodness in it to be seen. And then, of course, Jesus, in verse 14, became flesh and dwelt among us. So, God is, you can see that God is so committed to the goodness and the restoration of the creation that he enters into it and he seeks to redeem it. And, 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 you know, in, in, in Revelation, when we get these pictures of, of, of the final redemption of everything, only Christianity has it like this, that this is the only place where the paradise is a physical one. The, 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 the paradise, the, the, the eternal kingdom of God that the, that the future of Scripture shows us that God is bringing is a physical reality. And, and there's this one strange passage in Luke 24, that the resurrected Jesus eats fish, and, and, and it's always, it, why would he do that? Isn't he spiritual now? Of course. But why, why would we think that being more fully spiritual would somehow make him less physical? A paradigm has crept in. The third one, the third competing paradigm, is that creation is just an accident. This is verse 3, counteracting this. Here's the thing. I don't know anybody who would affirm, personally, who would affirm the creed and say, yes, I believe that God created the heaven and, and, and earth, but at the same time say that nothing was created on purpose, that it was all just an accident. It's never a, a, a c c completely broad-stroked understanding. But the question, though, becomes, do we believe that he had his hand in the creation of everything, or did he just spin the top and let it go? Verse 3 tells us that all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. But if we adopt some of the secular worldview that sees creation, at least in part, as accidental or the result of unguided natural selection, maybe God set it up, but how involved is he? If we believe some of the details were not created by design and therefore do not have an intentionality behind them, we will inevitably begin to question a lot of things that are pretty important, not least of which is, are we or am I an accident? If, if, if I have no certainty of, of, of God's intentionality uh, behind everything that is created, I have no certainty of God's intentionality in the creation of me personally. I have no guarantee of purpose. I have no guarantee of purpose for everyone else that I see and everything that I see. It, the line will fall somewhere. See, if, 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 and if we could be accidents, 
if, if what we see around us could be accidental or not the result of intentional, divinely in, uh, guided creation and ongoing provision, as Psalm 104 tells us, if everything does not fall under that umbrella, if some level of secularism is right, then we can never say that that is unjust and we should protect this part of creation. And we can never say that we must care for these people or those people or this situation because they have dignity and purpose in this. Well, who says? Who draws the lines? How do we know? Because the only purpose that we can be sure of in that mentality is to decipher how can I use the resources of creation to make my life the most comfortable in this moment. That's it. It's just a section of resources without intentional purpose except for the purpose that I can give it to increase the creature comforts of my own life. But the doctrine of creation says that there is a purpose and that everything, me, you, and everything that we see was intentionally made because everything that was made was made through him. And the fourth competing paradigm is that creation itself holds life. Okay, so we say that God made the heavens and the earth, but under that acknowledgement, maybe we can hold a deeper belief that could distort our relational experience. That deeper level belief may be a form of pantheism that causes us to try to ignore creation and just rise above it. Or maybe it's a legalism that makes us look down on creation and, and physical reality and pleasure. Or a view that leads us to exploit it for our own gain because we don't know God's purpose so we make our own. But another view worships it, elevates it beyond the place of where scripture says God is offering it to us. And, and it basically is the paganism of ancient Europe before Christianity worked its way in. It sees life in the mountain and in the water, life in the tree, and it tends to try to soak up the life from the physical space and reality. Now, I know that may sound completely removed from our modern lives, but we do this all the time. I do this all the time, and I'm assuming you're no better than I am. I look to something. I expect to get something out of it more than it was created to give me. And, and, and in that, I turn it into an idol. I do this with my stuff, with music, with motorcycles. I, I, whatever's in this cup, it's coffee. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I do this with a whole series of things that you could categorize as money to noise converters. Um, and we do this with nature itself. We, we, when we don't look beyond the created, to the creator, our hearts will attempt to rest in those things. They are valid pointers to God. Paul tells us that in Romans 1. But they do not in themselves contain the life that we need. In other words, we look to certain things that are created that have a pleasure involved in them. But sometimes we don't see the creator behind the pleasure. C.S. Lewis says it's this way in The Weight of Glory. He says, the books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we trust to them. It was not in them. It only came through them. And what came through them was longing. If they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of their worshipers. For they are not the thing itself. They are only the scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, and news from a country we have never visited. Here's what he's saying. It, it will break our hearts if we let it, because this is what John says in John 1. In him, verse 4, was life. He created the world, but in him was life. In him was light. If we believe in the creator of creation, as the Bible presents him to us, we can't exploit creation and only look for what we can get out of it. We also can't ignore the reality in front of our faces and try to spiritually transcend it. And we can't fear it or despise it as a legalist might, but we also can't worship the physical realities and look to these things of the world as if they hold a source of life. Because they don't. 
Not ultimately. They only point to it. So what's the alternative? What do we actually do? How do we actually, try, how do we actually say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and mean it while living in the middle of this creation that he has made? Let's look at a couple things quickly. First, secondly, I guess the nature of nature. Verses one through four. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus' first miracle um, in the Gospel of John, if you just keep reading, one of the very next things that happens. First thing, to show his power, he turns water into wine. Why does he do this? I mean, you could say one level... He's showing his power over creation and so forth and the forces of nature. Yes, but he does this specifically to bring the party to a higher level of enjoyment. (laughs) Do we consider that a good use of his power? And if we don't, why not? The doctrine of creation should cause us to say that physical pleasure, as opposed to the way the legalist would view it, physical pleasure is innocent until proven guilty, not guilty until proven innocent. Later, also in The Weight of Glory, C.S. Lewis says this. The faint, far-off results of those energies which God's creative rapture implanted in matter when he made the worlds are what we now call physical pleasure. When God created the world, there was a rapture, there was a pleasure, there was a love. Look at the way John describes it in the beginning here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and, and everything was made through this relational, there's this withness going on. This, it's an intimacy. It's, it, they created the world together. And, and if we take seriously where creation came from, we should be the most enjoyable and playful people on the planet. We should be able to sit in the pleasures of music and a great meal and a, and a, and a sunrise Or a sunset, if you don't like getting up early, I get it. Or opposite, you get the idea. We should be able to sit in the presence and affections of another person. Not just because we say, I like this or this feels good, but to sit in the awareness of knowing where this comes from. What's going on here? This This is pointing me to a glory beyond itself. Another thing about creation, if we take it the way it's presented to us, it's going to have to cause us to engage in the world around us once we deny those competing paradigms. One final quote from C.S. Lewis, and I'm done. (laughs) And this one may feel a little harsh because there's a curse word in it, but he uses it in the way it's supposed to be used. And so it shouldn't be as offensive as it seems. He's making a theological point, so just recognize that. This is in mere Christianity. He says, confronted with a cancer or a slum, the pantheist can say, if you could only see this from the divine point of view, you would recognize this is also God. The Christian replies, don't talk damned nonsense. For Christianity is a fighting religion. It thinks God made the world, but it also thinks a great many things have gone wrong with the world that God made. And God insists, and insists very loudly, on our putting them right again. Years ago, my wife made me a bag. It was a little zippered pouch. You put stuff in it, you know, put it in your car, on a desk, whatever. It was nice. I liked it. I liked it a lot. Um... I used it for a bit, and then one day the dog got a hold of it when I wasn't home. Um, we don't have that dog now. Um, uh, wait a minute. This story, this story is not about how we got rid of the dog. The, the dog passed away. I, that's, sorry. Just a coincidence. Just a coincidence. The saying, don't blame the dog we have now for this story is a different dog. Anyway, point is, the dog tore it up. I think you all knew where that was going. And, and, uh, and it didn't seem usable to me anymore. I didn't see the point in it. I didn't see the purpose in it, and I threw it away. My wife came home later that day, opened the trash, and she had some questions. Um, she wanted to know why I threw the bag away, 
I said, because it was broken. And she said, did you not think I could fix it? And I said, I didn't think it could be fixed. And she said, you never asked. And uh, you, know, you know how these conversations go. Um, but she took the bag out of the trash. She repaired it, she redeemed it, she restored it, and she gave it back to me, and I still use it to this day, and I'm never throwing that bag away for the rest of my life. We're told in Scripture that God made everything. We're also told that some things happened, and now this world that he has made is to some extent broken. We are the world around us. There is sin, there is death. But God is committed to making it right again. And if our purpose, if our, 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 our intentional response to the physical realities of this world is a response that resembles dismissing, that resembles some, that this is unimportant, or that this is unredeemable, I think it shows that we are still learning what it means to say and confess that we believe in God, the creator of heaven and earth. We see what God created. We also see that it's broken, and we also see that he intends to mend it. And if we're committed to him, we will be committed to this creation and the physical realities of this space that he's placed us in. So when he comes back, he finds us honoring what he has made, not working against the plans that he has in store for the redemption of this world. Besides that, creation is also our fellow worshipers. Psalm 19 tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. And famously, Elizabeth Elliot used to put it this way. A clam glorifies God better than we do because the clam is being everything it was created to be, whereas we are not. So we humble ourselves before creation, before the trees that sing his praise before the heavens that declare his glory. We humble ourselves before clams that do a better job of being what God made them to be. It should dramatically increase the respect that we have for creation to say that we believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, not to the level that we are worshiping it because they are worshiping God with us and they are declaring the glory of God more consistently than we do. But if we don't have that attitude, if, if, if we're going, if we don't feel ourselves inclined in that way, what are we going to do about it? If we're not moved to be involved with conserving nature and intervening in, in physical issues like poverty and social justice, if we're not comfortable with appreciating physical pleasure, I don't think it's enough to simply say that God is the creator and therefore, yada, yada, yada. No. There's a belief underneath that belief that's taking us off track because I don't think we're ever going to be committed to creation until we see how committed the creator is to us. Otherwise, we're asking something of this relationship with ourselves and the creation and God that that seems disproportionate to the relationship as we see it. We're never going to be this committed to creation until we see how committed the creator is to us. So let's look at this last point very, very quickly. Recreator. I'm not going to reread that whole section because we'll pick out a few verses as we go. I just want to say this. Verses 1 and 2 give us a little insight into that life of God and what it cost him to take us, take creation, and do something about the brokenness, our sin, and our death We're told in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. And then in verse 18, it restates the withness of the word at the Father's side. Relational intimacy. Intimacy at a level that I cannot fully comprehend. But there's another relational dynamic that we all know operates in conjunction with relational intimacy, and that is the pain of rejection. The deeper the intimacy, the greater the pain and the misery of rejection. I don't think I'm saying anything you don't already know. And Jesus came to earth and was rejected by the people of the world he has made. Verses 10 and 11, he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. It's an immense amount of rejection that I can't even imagine that. But it's not just that. On the cross, he became rejected by the father, the child paying the debt of the enemy so the enemies could become the children. That's how committed God is to creation, to us. If, until we believe not just that God is the creator in general, but that through Jesus, 
He is the creator who was willing to become creation. So to be uncreated, so we could become new creations. Do we believe that? Do we believe that our creator was willing to become created for the purpose of being uncreated so we could be recreated? Until that moves us, and, and, and we're either going to be fearful and rejecting of creation and physical reality, or we're going to try to let it define us and fuel us. For example, that passage from 1 Timothy 4 that talks about that everything being good, the context of that is coming from a place where Timothy's saying that people are, are preaching these things whose conscience is seared, meaning they, they don't know the grace and the love of God, and they forbid people to get married and eat certain foods, and, but... Paul says everything God created is good. Paul is saying if we don't know God's grace and love, if we're not sure of it, if we don't feel absolutely accepted by him, we're going to be a denier. And in, in, in all the wrong ways, we're, we're, we're going to say, I've got to stop doing this, I've got to stop doing that, and others should too if they want to be right with Jesus. Because that's the only way I can assure myself that I'm okay. But until we know that, on one hand, we're going to be afraid of pleasure. We're going to restrict ourselves and demand other people do the same. Or on the other hand, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says, let those with wives live as if they had none, and let those who mourn as if they wept not, those who are happy as if they laughed not, let those who buy and possess as if they possess, buy as if they possess not, for this world in its present form is passing away broader context that he is saying that if we understand the reality in which we actually live, that we've been placed in by God, then we're going to hold everything with an open hand. Our spouse, our kids, our jobs, our friends, even our own lives, our past wounds, our achievements, our health, everything held with an appreciating open hand. Saying those things shouldn't define us. And I realize that's cliche. But if we don't functionally trust in God as our creator and purpose giver in this world, we will replace him with another. But even if we believe and accept that he made the world, and even us, we still feel the brokenness and the effects of sin in us and all around us, and this feels this deep longing for this world and even our own lives to be recreated and renewed and restored. Maybe he was the Almighty who made everything good once, but is he enough to make it good again? Make us good again. Make us new again. And that's often, if I'm being honest, that's what I'm looking for. I don't want my job or my stuff or relationships to fill in the blank. I'm not, I'm not looking for them to create me. I'm looking for them to recreate me, to make me into something new and better, better than I think I am in my already created broken life. But they cannot save me, and the only one who can is my creator who became created to be uncreated so I could be recreated. And unless we trust that, we're either on one hand going to be afraid of pleasure or we're going to be trying to pursue creation as a life giver that it's not. I think we can all identify with something. But what, but, but what happens? Are we gonna walk out of here and try harder? I don't think that's gonna work. I don't think it will produce the change we're looking for and desiring until we know and trust the creator was willing to be created, to be uncreated so we could be recreated. And until, until we see that, that although he was God, he left to be rejected so we could be accepted, until these things begin to work their way into our heart of hearts, until we believe in the maker in this way, in the creator in this way, who became created to be uncreated so we could be a new creation, not born of the will of men, but of God. See, it's one thing that I believe, to say that I believe that he's my savior. And that's important. But it's another thing to see the ramifications of God as creator in our salvation. And that's why we sing the song, All Creatures Ever God and King, around here so often. Let all things their creator bless and worship him in humbleness. Oh, praise him. That's what we'll do. Let's pray.